Hey guys, I'm Rachel Grossman. I'm on the executive committee working with Asha and all the others I'm sure you've met already. I'm introducing Jeff Pass for the workshop on, which I should know, um, on the architecting AI industry events for diversity and inclusion. So like this one. Um, Jeff made his first website in 1997 um, he's been a World IA Day DC organizer since 2013, and he's now the diversity and inclusion co-director for the inaugural, inaugural IA conference in Orlando this March. Also, he let me know that his safe word is muskrat, so if you feel like using that, go ahead. Hello party people looking for the perfect beat. No Bombada fans? Seriously? Okay. So I'm Jeff Pass. As you've already heard, my safe word is muskrat. Use it if you need to. It was given to me by my client. Um, so that should tell you all you need to know. Um, uh, before I talk, I want to do a few more thanks. All of the sponsors make this possible and all the volunteers. This is a 100% volunteer organization. Today doesn't happen without people giving up their time and organizations like the two you just heard from giving up their money. So can we please thank everyone involved? And I'm going to do it again at the end of my session. Okay, so this workshop is called Architecting IA Industry Events for Diversity and Inclusion, and it's not really a workshop, it's not really a panel, it's kind of, it's a free form, it's an experience. So let's get started right away. Why this guy talking about diversity and inclusion? I am, if, if you want to talk about designing for normal, I am what I think for the last, since the infancy of the web, what normal was considered. I am white, I am straight, I am a breeder, I have a home, I have a car, I have all of this crap that people have been designing for since the early days of the web and certainly for all of the days of print. But I'm not normal, as anyone who knows me will attest. There's nothing normal about me and there's nothing normal about anyone. So the whole idea about designing for difference or difference becoming the new normal or however you want to hashtag it, because I always get the hashtags wrong and I always get what's at the end of LGBT bleh, wrong, um, it doesn't matter, we just need to move towards that goal. So why me? Um, for the last God knows how many years, more than a millennia, if you count the transition from the aughts, uh, from the 20th century into the 21st, I have been helping to organize events in this domain and also in my previous domain where I was doing counterterrorism work. Um, World IADC, this, um, this day, I've been involved in the last five years, four or five years organizing. This is my first year where I'm not on the executive committee. Um, and uh, it's really nice to be on this side of the podium rather than sweating for all, the, all those people that are volunteering and working their butts off. UXPADC, I helped curate that the last time around. UXDC was the name of the conference then. GoodGovUX, I was one of the founding members there and have been working on the um, terms and definitions group ever since its inception. Um, IA Summit, now IA Conference. Um, I'm the uh, diversity and inclusion co-director for this year, for the inaugural year. Uh, along with um, a, a very fabulous um, co-co-director, um, Michael, who uh, we're doing great stuff there. We'll talk about that a little bit. And I've been running communities of practice for my last couple of em uh, employers, and diversity and inclusion has always been one of the goals. Um, so in all those organizational roles, this has been something I've been focused on. And uh, you know, it's, it's all of our responsibility, and I think we all need to step up in whatever capacity we can, and that's kind of what today's about. So. We're going to start with an exercise. I'm going to bring up my panelists because I'm going to force them to be part of the exercise, um, but I'll introduce them later. And this is a shared exercise because we can't do it with everybody in the room. We just don't have a, the, the, the facilities and the space to do it. So I'm going to explain some stuff, ask for some volunteers from the room, and whoever raises their hands first, I'm going to just basically call on you. So uh, if I could have, actually, I'll, I'll wait, hold off a little bit. So we're doing an exercise called DOTS. You'll see why we're doing it soon. Um, it's gonna be an observed experience, as I, as I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna need, I'm gonna say 15 because of the space, like probably 10 or so volunteers plus um, the panelists, that'll make about 15. Um, there'll be no talking once it begins, and if you're a volunteer, you need to be comfortable with my touching your forehead and putting on a sticker, a skin safe sticker. It's an Avery 5472. <laughs> or an Avery other number, if you want to look it up to make sure that, you know, if there are hypoallergenic considerations. Um, and, and uh, okay, so moving into the setup. No one talks once this thing begins. Said it again, I'm gonna say it on one more slide, because I mean it. 
it's important to the exercise. That includes ASL, by the way. I'm jumping ahead one slide, but whatever. Um, participants are going to come up front. They're going to basically stand in a half circle around me, and I'm going to put the dots on their head. I'll explain the rules of the exercise, and then we'll begin, and you all can watch. One more thing before I ask for volunteers to come up. We want to try to keep the action, as it were, kind of inside this stagey space so it can be caught on camera. Okay, so, oh, I'm going to go back for just a second. Can I have my panelists join me kind of in the common area? And is one of these mics? Because you haven't seen enough of me yet. Okay, uh, if I can have my panelists join me up here, and if there are the first, let's say, 10 to 15 people that would like to volunteer and join for this, come on up. It's really, it's really gonna be fun and easy. You don't have to speak. In fact, you are explicitly forbidden from speaking. We need a few more. It's as easy and fun. Come on up, you just come, come, come. And whoever's up and on their way now, let's stop there. I think we got a, we got a good enough group. No, no, if you're already on your way, finish coming. <laughs> okay, now I'm gonna put this back and go where I can wear three instructions. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'm gonna put some dots on people's heads. I'm gonna walk around, I'm gonna put dots on your heads. Please do not do anything say anything from this point forward, and then I will tell you, oh, I'm giving the instructions too early. Okay, here we go. You are talking. No talking. <laughs> Jeez. And it's the panelists misbehaving. OK, we're going to start with the instructions now. Remember, there's no talking, no exceptions, no ASL, no hand talking. Um, OK, you have three minutes. Find the group you belong to. Go. Stay in the frame. And if you need to spill out off of the, the, the um, stage, please do so. I don't want you to like be falling off the edge or anything. It would seem like groups have sort of coalesced. OK. Is there anything still happening? And scene. Beautiful. OK. You're allowed to talk now, but you probably won't want to talk for a minute because I'm going to do some debrief stuff. So what do we have here? Uh, we have a group of greens. I'm sure you can all hear me. We have a group of greens. We have a group of yellows. We have a group of reds and oranges. And we have a group of blues. We all knew that this exercise was a setup. I set you all up and you knew it when you came up on stage. We're information architects, we love to organize things. We can't help but organize things. And we automatically organize things by logical groupings. We have a group of green, we have a group of yellow, we have a group of red and orange, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. We have a group of blue. This is what we do as IAs. We help make information meaningful by grouping it and making it easy to find. But here's the thing, Glenette is orange. She's not red. Now, I, I didn't take colorblindness. I, I should have had letters to make it unambiguous, but then people would have known, been able to self-identify their colors. But this group created a group that wasn't only color-based. And I'm, it's everything I can do not to like break out into colors right now, the, the song by Ice-T, um, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, but what we could have seen is a group of people with dots on their head. But we don't, we don't get to that naturally. We naturally create groupings. 
So I'm going to talk about this by way of debrief a little bit more. I would like everyone to thank all of our volunteers. If you have any comments before you are heading back to your seats, please to share into the microphone. Otherwise, please sit down. And if my panelists would just remain on stage, and you can sit on the, the riser or stand as you are more comfortable. We'll do a little bit more debrief on this. Oh, and you can take off the dots. Or you can keep them if you like. So you are allowed to take your dots off. Why you would want to, I do not know. Um, so we, we have a really interesting job as information architects or user experience professionals or whatever job under the umbrella of UX, DX, CX, whatever X your organization, whatever letter your organization puts in front of the X, we have a really weird job. And it, it forces us to try to create meaning in the way that is most meaningful to the largest group of people. And that makes good sense. But by doing that, we are necessarily making decisions that exclude people. The dot exercise is a really great way of showing that because despite your best intentions, despite trying to find the group that you belong to or to create a group that involves everyone, well then you're violating the group of reds or blues or greens and not letting them have that identity. So it's a really, really tricky thing to do. And it is, it is a, it's, it's a wire act and it's a sort of Damocles if you are a person who is actually organizing one of these types of events. So that takes us to our panel. Um, architecting events for diversity and inclusion. So if you have not been to an event run by one of the people sitting up here on the DS with me, at least that you know of, and I'll list off a few, IA Summit, UXDC, uh, excuse me, UX Camp DC, UX Camp Pittsburgh, UX Camp, is it New York or it's UX Camp New York, um, UXPA, um, UXPA, VRUX, uh, VRUXDC, um, UXDC, and I know I'm missing one. This one. This one. Oh yeah, why <laughs> add? If you've never been to any of those events, raise your hands, <laughs> excluding today. Okay. And for everyone else, so you guys don't know what you're missing yet, but for everyone else, let's give the panelists, before I've even introduced them, a round of applause for bringing this sort of programming <laughs> over the years. Okay, so let me introduce your panel just very quickly. And I'm not gonna go into people's backgrounds. What we're really talking about here is organizing events like this and what can we do to make World IA Day DC. Um, oh, in my introduction of myself, yeah, I did say that I'm the, the diversity and inclusion uh, co-director for UAC, uh, IA Conference. So for IA Conference, for this event, World IA Day DC, for all of the events that are currently being organized by these folks or who these folks are serving as mentors for, for the next generation of leaders, this panel wants to focus on what we have done, what we can do, what we've learned through the process of trying to architect events that are as inclusive, that are as diverse, and that are as safe, and that's the one we talk about the least because it's very uh, difficult uh, legally uh, as possible. So, Allie Tobolsky. Um, Allie is what is the, she's gone. She was the president of UXPA DC chapter. She ran UXDC. She helped run User Focus, the predecessor to UXDC, and she has run innumerable uh, UXPA DC events. Um, uh, sitting next to Allie is Glenette, uh, Glenette Clark. She founded UX Camp DC. Um, has since uh, sort of, I don't know if federated is the right word, but it has spread out to Pittsburgh. It has spread out to New York. There are now UX camps in other places that I don't know if they're directly affiliated or loosely affiliated or not affiliated with UX Camp DC. But that is, if you do not know, uh, an unconference that always happens one of, the first, um, one of the first Saturdays in January. As far as I'm concerned, it's the start of the conference year. It's when a lot of people um, come out and start working through and workshopping their presentations that you will see later at UXPA, UX, uh, Midwest, IA Conference, whatever. Um, sitting next to Glenn is Daniel Newman, or Dan Newman. Um, he has actually spoken, not on this stage, but at World IA Day DC, either in 2015, 2014, 2016, one of those, talking about the NPR One application and some of the great work that's being done by NPR. Um, but in today's capacity, he's talking um, with regards to his experience as an organizer of IA Summit, which has now become IA Conference. Um, and you ran Atlanta, as I recall, which was 2016. 2016. Okay. 
Um, and finally, we have Asha Singh, who for five years has been helping run this event, chairing it uh, this year, co-chairing it with me the two years previous, working incredibly long hours to make this happen. And uh, I'll, I'll let you on a little hint or a little secret. Um, she's not an IA. Uh, she is a person who is bringing business sense <laughs> to organizing these crazy things, and by extension is one of our tribe. And um, so for all of our panelists, just a, one more little thank you before I start putting some questions to them. Um, okay, so you'll see these boards sort of scattered around, and we're going to use those later, and I can't actually see one. I'm going to turn one around for just a second. This is a preview of the exercise we're all about to do. I would like to talk to my panel about their experiences, observations, lessons learned, and recommendations from running events in our space with an eye towards what can we do, what have we done, what do we continue to do, and do we need to adopt, begin doing, in order to make the most diverse, inclusive, and safe events possible. So again, this is looking forward to what we're going to be doing as a group as soon as the panel ends. But I just want to put to all of my panelists, um, maybe you should share a little bit of background about how you got into organizing the events that you got into. And uh, this will be a very organic conversation, but share some of your experiences and observations and lessons learned and recommendations. And just to clarify, um, experiences would be something that happened to you directly. Obviously, uh, uh, observations, something that you observed in the process of running these events or attending them. Um, and then lessons learned, of course, is pretty obvious, and recommendations, things that we as a community, we as organizers, whatever, can do to sort of make our, um, make our events and by extension our community and our tribe and hopefully then the larger culture of our community and our tribe more uh, diverse and inclusive and safe. Um, so Allie's shooting death stares at me. And Daniel has, a, Daniel has a microphone, so I'll start with him. Go, Dan. I was gonna hand it to someone else, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I uh, got involved with the IA Summit uh, because I loved the event. Uh, I went to, the IA Summit was the first conference I went to as an IA, or I've never been an IA, as someone who is IA affiliated, um, a UXer, a designer, whatever label I'm, I'm wearing adjacent. right now. Yeah. Uh, and, and I went and I was immediately taken by the community and all the people there. Um, it wasn't about necessarily the, the, what I learned, although I learned a lot but it was about the warmth of the community. And so after going for a few years, uh, in 2014 I got myself, or 2015 I got myself involved on the organizing team as the attendee experience director. And, uh, and that was an opportunity to start helping shape what the event was outside of the programs. That was more about how did we make sure people feel welcome? How do we make them feel included? How do we make sure that it is a, a safe and caring environment? We were the team that first created a code of conduct for the IA Summit. Uh, and we were really proud to be able to do that. And then in 2016, I had the opportunity to step up and be one of the three co-chairs of the event. And so as co-chair, you're kind of responsible for all of it, uh, obviously with a lot of strategic delegation and help from the amazing community. And so with that, we were able to program the event, uh, market it, get people to it. And the thing I will say that I'm most proud of is our effort in building a strong pool and pipeline for speakers. Uh, because as we know, a lot of industry events see the same mostly white, older guys on stage, and we didn't want to do that at the IA Summit. We think it's really important that the event be a true reflection of the community as much as possible. And so the biggest thing that we could do as chairs was to get the word out as widely as possible uh, about the submission process, make it easy, make it, make it possible for people who have never submitted to a conference before to get their submission in and be able to assess the whole pool of speakers and really look for those people who are new to the event, people who don't normally have a voice. And so we had nearly 50% first time speakers at our event, which was amazing. We had a gender balance of 50-50. We worked really hard to bring diverse voices from all over the country and all over the world. And so um, there's a lot to unpack there, uh, but I think that that tells you a little bit about how I got involved and in, about the event. Thank you very much. Would, would one of you like to go next? Because I can also fill dead dead air with my <laughs> dulcet tones. Sure. So um, when I started when, we, when I started UX Camp in 2010, um, didn't know what to expect. Um, it was the first time any 
type of thing had been held just in the U.S. period. Kind of stole the idea from London, but you know they kind of do things first over there sometimes. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know who was going to show up. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just know that I wasn't going to take have to take time to invite speakers because. I didn't know people in the community. This was brand, it was brand new uh, to me. And I really was about learning, sharing, and you know, just, just trying to figure out what is this new thing called US. So um, surprise, surprise, um, standing at registration, and in walks Jared Spool. And I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> it's you. And he was like, it's you. Like, he didn't know me from Adam's house cat, but it was still cool that he, you know, showed up, and he's been showing up um, every year since. But um, it was it, what was interesting to me is the actually out of the the lack of diversity um, out of the people who attended. I can count on one hand the people of color that actually attended um, that first event and for the first few events after that. So I don't, I mean, I didn't, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden it just, there was this explosion um, of more, more women, more people of color, um, more of everything. And I'm really proud of what um, I've been able to do with the help of you know volunteers and organizers to kind of help launch people into speaking um, at other larger conferences and so I love hearing Jeff speak and some other people um, who have spoken at UX con at um, a UX camp conference who have gone on to speak other places um, you know authors and Clarissa um, in a while, but she was the speaker there and she wrote a book for Riley. So I'm really happy um, to see that, you know, this, that my event, that this event has had such an impact on the community and the profession. So before the next person, I'm going to take that away from you because clearly we're talking serially, not at the same time. So, and you're holding it. I feel so bad. So I'll be the one. I've known Jeff about six years, if you can't tell. Very good friends. Um, so I moved to the DC area coming up on just about six years ago now, um, and was this, this combination of completely overwhelmed and terrified, but super excited about everything there was to do and learn, especially growing into a new career. And I found, like Lynette said, oh, this thing called UX. Let's find out all about this, right? So I started going to event after event after event and building my network and, and learning more and building the things that I, I found to be interested in. And a as I did this, I found myself really wanting to become a bigger part of it. And I thought, oh, this is, I'm tired of just attending. I, I want to, I see ways I can make this better. I can bring in more people. I want to do this thing. So I started getting into organizing with uh, UXDC conference in 2015. I, I loved it so dearly. I loved the organization so much. I ended up running for vice president of the, of the organization, uh, UXPADC. It was a thrilling election. I got all the votes uncontested. <laughs> <laughs> And then I moved into two years of presidency and have recently happily passed the torch to uh, Jordan Higgins back there. Um, in this, I, I have either done so myself or supported other people uh, in, in monthly programming for the organization, our, uh, the UXTC 2015, UXTC 2017, which I directed. Jeff and I will talk that mo about that more. Um, and as I as I kind of moved through these processes, I learned a lot about our community and about uh, myself as well. And I think one of the things that we need to think about when we think about diversity and inclusion are not just the characteristics that sometimes you can see, like maybe race, maybe gender, maybe age, some of the things we can guess about, but also people's spiritualities, their political leanings that sometimes um, we don't push ourselves to, um, to move into what we feel as our unsafe spaces to experience those things as well. 
Um, so that's one of my key takeaways, is to make, to push yourself, pursue the things that, in, that excite you and you feel, you, that give you a fire, but also push the things that don't, that make you uncomfortable, make you challenge yourself. Yeah, do you want to mind passing that? So while the microphone's on its way to Asha, um, and I won't speak to what you're doing here today in case you want to, but um, uh, there's a lot of things where you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you are part of an underrepresented group, like right now if you go to register for the IA conference, uh, you'll get a, there'll be a survey asking you a bunch of questions, like things like, um, uh, is there any, any way in which you have been discriminated against or experienced uh, diversity and inclusion issues? And tell us what that is so that we can alleviate it. There, there are people that maybe uh, don't like, that, that, that need a quiet room. And we didn't really think about that until someone brought it to our attention because it was either a bunch of extroverts organizing the thing or a bunch of people who just assumed that everyone that would go to a conference like this was an extrovert. So making your voice heard by whatever mechanism, it doesn't have to mean you have to go out in front of a crowd and like say, we need quiet rooms. Send the email, make the phone call, but let us know so that we can help accommodate you because we'll do everything we can within reason, but we don't know what we're not getting right without feedback. Um, Asha, I sorry. mean, I can pick up on that thread, so hi, because you haven't heard me enough. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I have been involved with World IA Day for a while, and um, as Jeff, as he let out my secret, um, I am not a practitioner of anything involving an ex. <laughs> so um, I was fortunate to be put on a project involving, um, heavily involving user research with Lisa Goldberg, if that name rings any familiarity. and. Um, we just end up talking a lot in our travels, it was a traveling project, um, about about this field and, and just stuff that I found interesting about it. And she's like, well, if you are interested, you should come to this conference that I help run and learn some more. And then I fell off a cliff and I've been here ever since. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's how I got into this. And um, I would say over my time here, there's been some wonderful um, volunteers, other organizers, very squeaky wheels or not so squeaky wheels who have um, pointed out some uh, items that would make the conference better year over year and that's led to in the five years that I've been involved and even before then um, some significant changes that have happened that I hope continue um, and I'm looking right at her uh, Regina there has been one of our, our strongest advocates for anyone who marks other I guess in any way shape or form um, to we've done things like uh, global sends the template for the decks we've checked um, color contrast on everything that we've ever produced and we've darkened the colors to make sure that it actually is compliant. That was one of her things. Um, every photo that we have on, um, or just about every photo that we t try to put out there on social media has, um, has the, oh my God, I'm accessibility, missing, tag accessibility yeah. uh, tags on there. That's something that we've just made it a point to do. We have a lactation and a prayer room because of what we've heard before. Um, this is the first that we've successfully had a gender neutral bathroom, even though we've been pushing for it for a few years now. Um, and this just goes to show you, you, you may not get it the first time and we may get pushback and you know, we're, we're in uh, spaces that are not our own and they're given to us uh, basically, I mean, not for free, it's a sponsorship, but um, there are certain things we can ask for and we can push for, but we can't demand necessarily because of legal restrictions. So within the bounds that we're able to do, what can we do to create spaces? Um, what compromises can we reach with the places that we're having these at so that we can ensure things are just more accessible to everybody? Um, yeah, so there's still more to do. Uh, also, I will pick up on a thread that you had earlier of uh, speakers because um, I am a PM by trade, I'll out myself. Uh, you cannot change what you do not measure, so um, or make a goal. So we have ratio, we have a ratio goal as far as organizers that we talk about every year of what what ratio we're looking for. What's our goal that we're trying to hit with diversity, um, just to ensure that we have a, a speaking day or people that are we're, we're showcasing that are reflecting the the community that's coming out to hear them. So yeah. So I pick up on two things there, um, and both with World IA Day, um, actually, well, not. The only one that would be an exception for what I'm about to say would be UX Camp because it's sort of self-organizing. Um, sometimes to create a diverse group of speakers, you have to aim for something more than proportional representation. Let's say if you have 10 speakers in a, in a day during a conference, 10% um, of the population is this, 10% of the population is that, 10, you know, 
the it, it adds up to more than the ten you have available. The, the the totality of the people you want to represent, and sometimes it requires over engineering. Maybe there will be a few less people that look like me that get to speak because we want to have a few people that don't look like me speak. Um, and it's a razor's edge making those decisions, the curatorial decisions. Anyone who takes on curation is incredibly brave, and it's 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 um it's it's not thankless because you get thanked when you get it right, but if you get it wrong, it's bad. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, having, non, uh, having gender neutral bathrooms today uh, is fabulous. It's the first time we've been able to do it, as you said. Uh, during one of the lightning talks, someone mentioned, you know, there should be gender neutral bathrooms. How hard is that? It, it shouldn't be hard. But my company, I think Sapien also, um, Publicis Sapien, how am I supposed to say it now? Am I saying Publicis Sapien or Sapien? Okay. Um, Any time a building gets, um, gets rehabbed, gets redone, uh, they're trying to put in bathrooms that can be multifunction bathrooms. But right now, if you have essentially a lobby where you're washing your hands and you don't have concealed cubicles, or if you have you know, urinals in the case of the men's room, it can never be a non-gendered bathroom. And it, there's a lot that's involved in engineering plumbing so that you can have side-by-side -side cubicles and then a shared wash space. There are things that we're up against that will take many, many years and buildings being raised to the ground and new buildings being built to get right. But things we can do, like setting aside a lactation room, a quiet room, um, uh, in the case of IA conference, taking the word acoustic off of the acoustic jam because people would go there and be, you know, overwhelmed by the fact that there's all these electric instruments and like people that have been playing and jamming together on the conference set. I mean, there's lots of things that we can do, um, and you know, we have to pick our battles really carefully um, because, for the most part, we're volunteers. For the most part, we are nickel and diming ourselves to death. We don't have the budget. Um, and, and I'll be honest, and I'll use the S word, there's nothing sexy about being the accessibility sponsor, about paying for captioning. Uh, and it's really hard to get that paid for. I mean, every year you struggle to get someone to pay for that. Um, so th it's a long road ahead. And um, so maybe if any of you have any examples, um, I'm thinking particularly, I don't know if you would like to tell the UX DC story about uh, trying to engineer rooms, or I can, if you'd rather. I'll give it a go, you augment. Oh, I'm always happy to augment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so for UXDC 2017, we're talking about, um, as always, the, the conference um, had an open submission period for proposals, and we do what we can to encourage a, a diverse collection of submissions. At the end, you get what you get, and you don't always have control over that no matter what you do. So some of the ways that we are able to exercise discretion after the, the proposal submissions have closed, reviewers have gone in and um, from the community and they've given us their ratings and their preferred selections, we go in as an, as an executive committee and further curate based on that. And where we can exercise some of that discretion is in terms of how prominently we display certain speakers, uh, how much time we give them on a stage, what room they're, they're in, for how, how many people that room can accommodate, um, uh, and making sure they're not lined up against someone who may compete with them too much on the schedule. So there, there's some things that you can do as organizers, uh, as organizers to play with that, but it doesn't, it doesn't always work. We, we have an example from 2017 where there was a speaker that we really wanted to, to be able to draw in a, a crowd. It's a great topic, it's something that we really cared about. So we gave her the ballroom. The ballroom could have fit hundreds of people. Everybody went to the other talks and she ended up in this giant, three times the size of this, a handful of people kind of sitting around her in a circle. And obviously she wasn't very happy, we weren't very happy as organizers, but it, there's, sometimes yeah. it's just, ha it's where the cards fall. So yeah, the, the absolute best, the, the road to hell is paved with best, uh, with good intentions. And sometimes trying to engineer or architect fairness bites you in the ass because you have a Dan Willis or a Dan Brown, uh, Dan Brown in a room and everyone wants to go listen to them. Even though in fairness, you have a lot more opportunities to listen to Dan Willis and Dan Brown because they're local and the person we brought in into the ballroom came down from New York and doesn't typically speak in DC. And you, you can't control for it. So sometimes we get it wrong. Um, and I, this is a total pivot here, but civility is something that isn't really uh, prominent in society right now. Um, but if we can find civil kind, honest, practical, and helpful ways to communicate, hey, you missed the ball on this one, here's what you could do better. I think in general, we all wanna try to do better. 
Um, it's just when, you know, a bunch of people don't show up and there's someone sitting in a ballroom uh, speaking to crickets um, and social media lights up, um, it actually makes a bad situation worse in many cases. So it's, it's a really difficult thing to do um, and to try to get it back to a topic that everyone can, can speak to, um, people who organize these events put in tremendous amounts of time, tremendous amounts of energy, and they kind of burn out. It's really hard. Um, and so I would put to the panel, and this will be the last question before we move to the group exercise, are there any major lessons learned as an organizer that you would pass on to the next generation? And is there anything that you would say to encourage the next generation of organizers to step up and, with their eyes wide open, uh, try to help create events in our domain and in our space that are diverse and inclusive and safe? I, I would say, I mean, one is engage with as many people in the community as you can, as widely as you can. Um, one of my colleagues uh, at WHYY in Philadelphia talks about uh, word of mouth marketing and how you know we rely on word of mouth marketing, in my business which is public media, because we don't have the budget to do other kinds of marketing. But you know what, when you rely on word of mouth marketing, you're only reaching the people who are already in the network with the people who are already your customers. That holds true for events as well. Uh, if you are not actively seeking to reach outside of your networks and leaning on people who are on the very edge of your network who are adjacent to other networks, you're never going to reach the widest possible, the most diverse audience you can. And so um, the lesson that we learned uh, and, and I continue to learn as I am involved in more events is just the power of asking people to get involved. Uh, you know, people are generally willing and, and really able to pitch in and help and, you know, be your best advocate for your event or, you know what, even beyond events. I mean, let's talk about a product or, or sure. IA, right? Like people who you engage with, who you, who you get them involved, they become your advocate. They become the people who champion what you're doing. But if you don't ask, if you don't give them the channel through which to participate, then you're stuck talking to the audience you already know. So obligatory for information architects, we do tree tests, we do card sorts. When you are recruiting those tests, recruit your outliers. Don't necessarily recruit your personas proportionally. Get some data on the people you don't usually get some data on. We can help to better understand the issues by, and, and you know, maybe, maybe that makes for a different test or a different way of analyzing the test, but if we, if we don't ask the questions, we'll never know the answer. And you, don't, you certainly don't have to speak because we, we will put it to the, we'll make all these guys, folks, <laughs> damn it. Guys, um, someone must grab me. You, uh, you, you have heard the safe word, right? I'm doing better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to emphasize the ratio thing again. There was a great um, TEDx talk that um, was not just about hiring, and I think it's true for events, hiring, anything. Um, what are the uh, what are the benchmarks you're trying to hit? What are the goals and the 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 numbers, if you will, that you're aiming for? It helps you. It helps me. Um, target something that is is nebulous, right? So if you have time for X number of speakers, what percentage are you making sure somehow you are setting aside for um, voices that aren't typically shared? And you can define what that is, you can define what that looks like on the company side of things. You know, are your recruiters held to, is one of the metrics that they're held to how many diversity candidates they bring in? If it's not, who's asking that question? Is it you? Because it should be. Um, <laughs> And then just making sure that you look around and see who is being um, who is being showcased, and making sure that it's it's not just the same cookie cutter um, sort of look or feel or thought or background of, of any kind. So, yeah. And, and if you have an event that's entirely um, submission driven, you you submit a talk, and you're not having you're not able to really hit those 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 goals consider curating a portion of the event. If we have 10 slots, we're gonna curate two of them, and we're gonna put eight to an open evaluation. Um, there are ways to do it, but it requires a lot of thought ahead of time. I'll um, just add on that too, Jeff. The, the, the people who have marginalized voices are often the ones who are gonna be most reluctant to accept your invitation. And so if you put out invitations to exactly the number of slots you have all at once, you're probably gonna hear from the majority voices first, yes, absolutely, you're gonna fill all your slots, and then you're gonna be scrambling to fill those diversity slots last, and that sucks, and it's not fair to the community, it's not fair to the marginalized voices who aren't otherwise heard. So it's really important when, again, as an event organizer, when you are inviting people to speak, invite the people who aren't often invited to speak first, make space for them mm -hmm. first. You can always fill the conference with more people who look like me. 
uh, and something IA Summit has done, um, I think we may have even started your year, is they have resources for first time submitters. Because someone who has been speaking on the circuit for 20 years, they, they probably have their proposals already written. Um, but if you provide resources to allow someone who's never submitted a proposal and isn't someone who's already on the inside track in one of those groups, that's a way to, to help folks out as well. So yeah, we don't do, we, you know, our board is still the day of, but we do occasionally have fails where we might schedule someone in a room that everyone go, wants to go to, um, to see that particular person based on their topic. Um, and not the other person. So we might end up with a small room with a whole lot of people and a bigger room with five or six people. So it, it happens, um, even though it is or organic. Um, and usually we do fill up the board, but as we've grown, specifically like in, in our first um, event in New York, um, people were reluctant to stand up and speak. So I walked over to them and handed them a topic card and say, you know something, so speak about that. Um, and I've had to do that um, in New York. I've done it in, you remember Regina. <laughs> I've done it in New York, I've done it in Pittsburgh, and even before we stopped uh, Mobile UX Camp, um, did that as well. And just you know, walked up to people and said, you know, I know you know something. And I think what happens the most is people aren't necessarily confident that they have something to, sh to say and to share. And just um, knowing that this community is really welcoming and sharing and understanding and um, is really helpful. Thank you, and thank you for saying that. I've had really wonderful experiences at UX Camp DC, and, and I myself had a session a few years back that because of just that, the board wasn't filling up, and I think it was actually Jeff who said, hey, Ali, you should get talk about something, and it was like, me, and I did, and it was great, and I learned from that, and it offers an opportunity to people who, for an event like this, it was, ex it, I would be, it's extremely unlikely that with the, the lead up and the pressure, that I would submit for a talk, that I would want to actually put myself on a stage independently, prepare slides, and it's, too, it's a lot of pressure for me. I, I have speaking anxiety, and I don't mind sharing that because I think it's something important to acknowledge for everyone here in the room, and UX Camp is a wonderful way to, uh, to give support to those voices that otherwise would not put themselves up on a stage. Mm -hmm. and, and to keep sharing love for UX Camp and for the Bar Camp model, um, there are things we can do to lower the barrier to entry. At UX Camp, you do not have to have slides. You do not have to have a formal presentation. You can just have a discussion in a room, and some of the best sessions I have ever gone to were a first-time speaker who wanted to ask questions of senior folks in the field, and we all just went into the room and had a fabulous discussion. So at different conferences, um, IA Summit, it may have even been your year, introduced lightning talks. Um, as organizers, we can find ways to lower the barrier to entry because, let's face it, a 60-minute or a 45-minute or a 90-minute session, uh, workshop, whatever, it, that's a daunting thing. A five-minute lightning talk may be a little bit easier for someone as their first step. Um, did any of uh, you panelists have anything else you wanted to add before we moved into the exercise, which will be kind of a continuation of the discussion? Yeah, Ali, please. I uh, just want to highlight the importance as, as organizers that you look past past the event portion of, of caring for the organization and really talk to your community about their ideas of what diversity and inclusion are so that you're true to form exploring the perspectives that aren't just part of your executive committees. Uh, okay, so what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna actually set this down. Um, we're, we're going to basically continue the same discussion talking about um, experiences and observations and lessons learned and recommendations and we're all going to do it together. So I have like three slides just like I did before, three slides that kind of say the same thing uh, and will give us all a chance to move around. So the goal of what we're going to do here is to share our own personal experiences which are things that happened to you, observations, things that you witnessed it and, they, and they're right next to each other. There's a line dividing them. You can, put your, you can put your sticky right in the middle if it's a little bit of both. Lessons learned, things that you, know, you took away and understand, and recommendations, maybe something that's more tactical and specific, but let's please keep them constructive and realistic. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these boards, and the boards work two ways. If, if, if you're in a group of all tall people, you may wanna go this way. 
if you're in a group of not so, it, um, just because I was trying to anticipate the space, self-organize. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five of these boards set up around the room. They're in contrived locations, I apologize, but we want to be able to get some of this interaction on camera. Um, and just start making your way to the board. I'll tell you what's going to happen. We're basically going to go through the same thing. Share your stuff. You're all sitting on sticky notes or pick them up um, and pens. So there's no excuse not to put something up on the board, but there's absolutely no expectation that you will. But share freely, share honestly. And um, I think our panelists are each going to kind of go out and pick a board, and we'll just sort of all work together to map some of the stuff out. Um, and if you want to start doing that, I'll keep talking as you move about the room. Um, so you're free to stand up, find a board, or, or sit down if you just want to watch the chaos. Um, so what's going to happen with the outputs of this exercise? I did this at UX Camp DC. I'm doing it here. I'll be doing the same exercise at um, IA Conference um, in March in Orlando. Um, and I'm going to pull together all of these findings and put them together into a, a, a paper, essentially put it out on, on Medium or elsewhere and share it out to the larger community. It's also going to be informing the diversity and inclusion and safety goals for this event, for IA Conference and other events going forward. We're going to share out all the information and the learnings and hopefully um, other organizers or you, if you choose to become an organizer, even if it's just a meetup, um, will uh, have these lessons and learnings uh, to share yourself. Um, there is also um, our keynote, our next speaker, Stacy, who's standing right next to me, is going to be talking about something that this can feed into very, very nicely. So um, a little primer for, for your uh, discussion there. Um, so let's get started. Remember, we're going to be sharing experiences, observations, lessons learned, and recommendations. I've given you a few examples. Get up, get up, get up. You don't need to see me. My god, no one needs to see me. Um, some examples of lessons, oh yeah, please. Um, some examples of lessons, I'll just read off a few to like as icebreakers. Lessons learned, adopt a code of conduct and enforce it, have plans and procedures for that. Um, train volunteers and staffs in that code of conduct. Um, indicate your displeasure or uh, discomfort clearly and confidently through some manner. Make it known that you are having an issue. Um, some experiences, if you were catcalled, if you were hugged by a very huggy conference attendee like myself and you didn't like it, um, if a more assertive person, let's say middle-aged white guy wearing spectacles with facial hair, asks all the questions and you can never get a word in edgewise. Um, observations, maybe volunteers that weren't prepared to deal with the code of conduct, or a white male speaker that gets the big room while others get small rooms, which we've kind of just discussed, and not having a quiet space. And finally, some recommendations. Only attend events with a code of conduct. Just Christina Walk, you won't go to an event without a code of conduct. Um, and there's a lot of people that won't do that anymore. Um, uh, cultivate uh, and include diverse, new, and alternative voices in your cur curation team, and also provide non-gendered bathrooms as you're able. Okay. Uh, and while we're doing this exercise, um, try to practice a community agreement that I love called step up, step back. So if you're a person who speaks up every single time and are very, um, you know, active and assertive, try to step back a little bit. If you're not, try to challenge yourself to write more or contribute to the discussion because your opinion matters and is very valuable. To the boards! So we'll do this for about 15 minutes and then we'll come back together um, and just have a few closing thoughts. Oh, no, I'm sorry, there's one right there. Uh, uh, there's one there that's kind of hanging up in the mind. There's three on the outskirts of your floor. So I think we get that closing Oh, and attached to each of the boards is a baggie that has more sticky notes, more pens, and my business card. And the reason my business card is there is because if you have something you want to share but you don't feel comfortable sharing it here, send me an email. I will make sure it gets included. I don't want people to feel that they have to put something on the board, especially if it's private or they have any hesitation whatsoever. So take my card, contact me, and I'll get your thoughts included.
15 minute warning. The fastest five minutes of your life. It's now a 10 minute warning because we need five minutes at the end to reconvene. Um, so 10 more minutes, maybe nine. And again, if you don't get something up on the board in time, you can continue adding as we're kind of debriefing at the end. We'll put the boards to the side. You can continue adding to them um, afterwards. And of course, you can email stuff to me as well. So we'll go for like another nine or so minutes, and then we'll reconvene very quickly before we end the session. Thank you. Uh, Daniel just did some fantastic process engineering. I'm going to pass out a bunch more of these dots, and if you have a plus one, if it happened to you, add some dots to, uh, to stickies so we can get a sense of the, the um, frequency with which maybe an individual uh, comment or observation might have happened to a person.
Five minutes. Okay, so if people want to start moving back towards their seats, I'll start some wrap-up type comments as we're doing that, so we can keep to time as much as possible, because I know that you people only come to these events for the happy hour afterwards. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so as you're, as you're coming back to your seats, um, we, we talked a little bit about how hard it is to organize these events, and if you look at this group that organized today's event, the Executive Committee for World IA Day DC, you will notice that I am not there. I've been there the last five years. This is, a, this is an incredible group of people that have done incredible work. So I would ask you all to put your hands together and thank them and, and for doing an, an event where there's some very risky, non-traditional presentations like this. Um, I would also like to send out sincere, oh God, I skipped a bunch of slides. Oh no, I didn't. Some of the slides came out. Um, I had another slide to thank my panelists, but um, I would like to thank um, Glenette and Dan and Allie and Asha. I would like to thank everyone who shared. Everyone who didn't feel comfortable sharing, I would encourage you to reach out to me if you wish to share. Um, and I would uh, send you all my sincere thanks for participating in this. I hope to see anyone who's interested um, and able to go at IA Conference. We'll be doing this one more time there. Uh, it'll probably be a more intimate circle, uh, a circle uh, around lunch, chatting together because we're gonna start getting a little bit more prescriptive about what IA Conference can do moving forward. Um, if you're able to join us, I would love to have you do so. Um, and if you have any questions, or want to continue the conversation, the slides, which are going to be posted, have all my contact information. And again, I have business cards all over the damn place. Uh, my company may even be hiring, so I can help you with that stuff too. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out. And I believe, oh, I've jumped right into some sponsor slides. So thank you all. And um, we'll actually end on time and stick around for the rest of the afternoon, especially for Stacy's presentation. I think you'll find it all fascinating. I'm so excited to hear it. Thank you again.